So there's been a lot of hand-wringing about the fact that the United States is losing its preeminence in science and math education. In fact, recently we've slipped to 48th worldwide. This is distressing because American economy, health, and security are all critically dependent on science and engineering. As a consequence of this situation, reports such as, the, as these have been um, indicating that we need to be putting a lot of effort into producing enough students with the interest, motivation, knowledge, and skills that they will need to compete and prosper in the emerging world. One of the ways that this problem is being addressed is scientists are being asked to volunteer their time to try to reverse this trend by talking to students, advising teachers, and uh, developing hands-on activities that can be used to inspire young minds. So today, I want to share with you a few of these activities that I've been involved in developing. In this effort, I have been motivated by two simple notions. The first is that I hated school. To me, school was a place of excruciating boredom. So in developing these activities and uh, lesson plans, I focused on things that I thought would have inspired me as a young child. The second is that I'm a scientist that happens to work on what I believe is the coolest natural phenomenon in the world, and that is bioluminescence. It's a tough word to spell, but it's got a simple meaning. Luminescence simply means cold light, and the bio indicates that it's cold light made by living creatures. Creatures such as fireflies on land and fish, shrimp, jellyfish, and squid in the ocean use light to help them survive, to be able to find food, to attract mates, to avoid being eaten. Because I work on such cool critters, I've um, got great stories for getting kids excited about science. For example, um, I can talk about what it's like to pilot a submersible, um, or discover a new species or new behavior, or for that all-important gross-out factor, I can talk about glowing corpses and radiant excrement. Never underestimate the power of ickiness to capture the wandering mind of a young student. So, for example, glowing corpses. A lot of people don't realize just what a devastating conflict the Civil War actually was in our nation's history. In fact, casualties during the Civil War exceeded those in all of our other conflicts and wars combined. As a consequence, bodies often lay too long on the field and were sometimes buried in shallow graves covered with only the thinnest layer of dirt. At night, some of these grave sites produced an eerie glow that led to rumors of hauntings and ghosts. In fact, that eerie glow was probably due to bioluminescence, but that of a creature that rivals alien in terms of the gruesomeness of its life cycle. Now, just as a refresher for those of you that aren't up on your xenobiology, in uh, Alien, one of my all-time favorite movies, the alien lays eggs um, that burst forth with a larva that then parasitizes the host, in this case a human, injecting a juvenile life form that then grows up into the adult and can lay eggs again. Now, the glowing corpses are probably the result of a similarly gruesome life cycle, but of this uh, little roundworm or nematode that has bioluminescent bacteria in its gut, but at such a low concentration that the worm itself doesn't glow. But just as an alien, it parasitizes its host, in this case, um, uh, moth larvae, by boring into the animal and regurgitating a little bit of the bioluminescent bacteria, which then become pathogenic and release toxins and enzymes. The toxins um, block the host's immune system, and the enzymes help break down the host's tissue, um, providing a nutrient broth, basically, that the bacteria can grow on. They then provide the food source for the nematode, which reproduces in the body of the host and then bursts forth en masse um, to repeat the cycle again. Pretty gruesome stuff and, and great stuff for getting kids interested. 
Interestingly, and probably related, also during the Civil War, there were uh, reports of soldiers with glowing wounds. And doctors also reported that many of the soldiers with the glowing wounds seemed to have better survival rates. So a couple of high school um, students in Maryland got interested in this for their science fair project. And they, first of all, were trying to find out if this was the same bacterium that caused the uh, glowing corpses, if, the, if it could cause glowing wounds. And they discovered, first of all, that the bacteria don't grow very well at body temperature. But then their research showed that a lot of these soldiers were suffering hypothermia. And so the lower temperatures of their limbs might have easily supported the growth of the bacteria. And the other thing that they discovered was that the bioluminescent bacteria releases antibiotics to reduce competition with other bacteria and preserve the cadaver so that the life cycle can be com completed. Um, so that would account for the better survival rates of these soldiers. So this is some pretty cool stuff for getting kids interested in science and leading to a lot of questions um, ab about a whole range of topics such as microbiology, physiology, pathology, the physics and chemistry of light, and even American history. <clears throat> the point is to get kids asking questions, to get them intrigued. For another example, glowing excrement. Thanks to Finding Nemo, a lot of kids now know that deep sea anglerfish have a glowing lure that is attractive to potential prey. But they may not know why that lure is attractive. And the reason is that it imitates a common source of food in the deep ocean environment. Most of the food that comes down from above is in fact fecal matter, or in middle school um, parlance, fish poop. So fish poop is covered with bacteria that helps break down the fecal pellets. If that bacteria is non-bioluminescent, then the fecal pellets will then just disappear into the dark depths that are nutrient limited. But if they are glowing, according to a hypothesis that was first put forth by Dr. Bruce Robeson, now they become attractive to deeper living organisms that consume them, and the bacteria are re reintroduced into the food-rich gut of the fish thereby um, sustaining them and keeping them up in the water column. So the light organ in the anglerfish imitates this glowing poop. And in fact, the light organ in these fish um, is filled with bioluminescent bacteria. The fish provide the um, bacteria with a growth chamber and nutrients, and the bacteria provide the fish with light. And interestingly, this is a, a discovery we made, which is a little anglerfish we brought up, and we discovered that it could actually turn the light off and it could actually point it in different directions, which we hadn't expected because bacteria glow all the time, but we think actually what's happening here is there's a mechanical shutter, almost like a clamshell, so that it can turn off the light when it wants to. And since this is something nobody's ever seen before, clearly this is a great thing to get kids talking about, you know, why does the fish do this? The point is just to get the creative juices flowing. And uh, bioluminescent bacteria are actually fairly easy to grow in the classroom. There are a lot of hands-on activities that can be used as lead-ins to talking about genetic regulation, uh, exponential growth, symbiosis, and microbiology, to name just a few. So these are good stories for getting kids hooked on science. And I've tried to produce um, some tools that would help with this. For example, uh, the bioluminescence coloring book. Uh, I got the idea for this when I was walking through a craft store and saw these glow-in-the-dark paints and thought, that would be a pretty cool idea for getting kids um, turned on to bioluminescence. And so I uh, partnered with a talented um, artist, Teresa Baker, who produced these great drawings of the animals. And I you know, had little write-ups for each animal to explain how they use their light. And at the uh, end, um, there's games and puzzles um, to reinforce the key concepts. And actually, the kids wanted to know what these animals actually looked like, so in the second edition, I included photographs of the animals, um, as well as materials of, for hands-on activities and where um, teachers can purchase things like bioluminescent bacteria and dinoflagellates and fungi and how they can um, use them in the classroom. So I, I love this as an activity because it hooks in kids that would normally be intimidated by science. Uh, science. They, a lot of kids, most kids, like to color. 
And with glow-in-the-dark paints, it makes it super cool. So we found that this is actually a very great tool for hooking kids all the way from grade school, school through high school. Um, because the kids want to know what these animals look like, um, I took a lot of the video that I've collected over the years during my research on bioluminescence and produced this 26-minute educational vid video called Secret Lights in the Sea, and I just want to um, show you the lead-in to it so you can kind of get the flavor for it. <clears throat> there are lights in the ocean, living, living lights. Hidden in, Hidden the, in the dark depths, these lights, these lights are rarely seen and little known. What are they? What are they? Where do they come from? While the creatures, While the creatures that, that produce these wondrous pyrotechnics can be found, can be found in every cubic meter of the Earth's oceans, images, images of their fiery displays are rare. But now, but now thanks to thanks recent, recent explorations, explorations with deep diving submersibles, remarkable, remarkable video recordings of this extraordinary phenomenon have been captured. In the deep, in the deep sea, sea, we have discovered, we have discovered an, an alien world teeming with life forms responsible, responsible for this spectacle of illumination. And as our, and as our underwater cameras come face to face, to face with the our, and our inhabitants of the depths, of the depths so, can so can we reveal the secret, the secret lights in the sea. So video is a great tool for getting kids interested in science, and uh, I think it's also a great tool for dealing with more complex concepts. For example, this is a DVD that I um, co-produced with the Marie Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and uh, we were talking about how animals adapt to life in the extreme depths, and obviously one of those ways is with bioluminescence. So when I'm talking to kids about bioluminescence, one of the points I like to make is that most bioluminescence in the ocean is blue, because fil uh, seawater acts like a filter that filters out the reds and the oranges and the yellows, so animals have evolved the wavelength that will tra travel furthest through seawater, which is blue light. Now, I can do that using this uh, graph, but obviously I think the vi this next video clip uh, does a much better job of conveying the concept. Sunlight is scattered and absorbed by seawater. In clear, in clear water, water, it disappears, it disappears at the rate of 10% for, for every 75 meters or 240, or 240 feet, feet of descent. Of descent. Watch, how, Watch the how the colors change. Red, red green, green, and yellow, and yellow are, the are the first colors to disappear. To disappear. Blue, persists Blue persists to the deepest depths, depths but, it but it too eventually disappears at around 800 meters, or the equivalent, or the equivalent of eight, of eight football, football fields. fields. But it takes more than hooks to um, get students involved in science. It takes great teachers to reel them in. Mine was my high school biology teacher, Harry Meserve, um, who cured me of my habit of daydreaming through classes because he told jokes. And if I wanted to get the jokes, I had to pay attention. But he was also a very gifted teacher, and one of the ways that he taught us about the scientific method was he assigned each student in the class a testable hypothesis. And the hypothesis he assigned me was most high school students have flat feet. Now, understand that uh, this was way before the internet. In fact, it was during the Vietnam War. And so I got the bright idea of going to the draft board and finding out how many draftees out of high school were rejected because of flat feet. This is apparently information of national security proportions, and they weren't willing to share that with me. Um, and so a lot of the things I tried weren't working, so I finally went to Mr. Meserve and told him about all my dead ends. And he wouldn't tell me what to do. He just kept asking me questions about where the data came from until finally a light bulb went off over my head, and I realized I can collect the data. And so I figured out a way to get ink prints and lined up my classmates and collected the data, made the measurements, ran the statistics, and managed to disprove the hypothesis for my limited data set. But in the process, learned a lot about the, the scientific method. So this is real hands-on science, or in, in my case, feats-on science. Um, but it, it's more than just reading about science, it's actually doing it and coming up with creative solutions to problems. So how do we go about creating more teachers like this that can provide this kind of excitement and hands-on activity that is going to produce our next generation of scientists and engineers? 
It's been said that all too often, especially our younger students, are being taught science and math by people that are themselves intimidated by the subject. So all they're doing is passing on their own phobias. I've been involved in a lot of teacher training workshops where I've tried to provide these hooks and excitement um, to uh, in-service teachers. And for teachers that already have a strong background in science and math, this is probably all that's needed. But what about those teachers that don't have that strong foundation? How do we reach them? Well, I've recently become in a, involved in a, a program that I'm extremely excited about, and that is uh, part of the new Center for Ocean Science Education Excellence, COSI Florida. Um, I'm a PI in this program, and we've developed a uh, project that we called Research Experience for Pre-Service Teachers, where we bring teachers in training into the laboratory for six-week internships and give them hands-on training on how science really gets done. So for our interns at ORCA, we actually had them doing an experiment, obviously involving bioluminescence, where they were using bioluminescent bacteria as a means of making pollution visible. So because <clears throat> the light output of bacteria is directly linked to the respiratory chain, anything that interferes with respiration in the bacteria um, dims the light. So you have this real-time, very cheap, quick assay for toxicity. And so we use this to test for toxicity in sediments and create pollution gradient maps. So we trained the teachers in how to do this. We also trained them in how to make four to five minute um, multimedia presentations so that they could talk about their experiences and then have these as tools to be able to share with their future students to show them that they had the street cred basically of doing real science. And I just want to share with you <coughs> the, the um, first minute of one produced by uh, Jennifer Abbott, shown in the uh, bottom right hand corner, where she addresses some common misconceptions about science and scientists. Growing up, I thought scientists were all boring lab rats with glasses and bow ties. I pictured these guys doing the same mundane procedures over and over and over. Since then, I have learned that science is interesting and always changing. But it was not until I started reading about the sick animals I spotted in the Indian River Lagoon. And then, and met, then the met the people that work at Orca. Orca. Did I realize, Did I realize just, how just how much creativity is involved, involved in scientific, scientific research? research. At, the at the Ocean Research, research and Conservation, and Conservation, 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 Conservation Association, or Orca, or Orca they have, they some, have truly some truly creative methods, methods of practicing, of practicing science. science. This elite, this elite team, team of scientists and researchers, researchers use creative, creative and innovative methods to determine if toxins are present in sediment. Sediment in the mud that sits at the bottom of water bodies. They have, they have also developed, developed a cost-effective way to track the pollution back, back to its source. Through the COSI, Through the COSI research, research experience for pre-service pre teacher program, program I helped Dr. Edith Litter, Litter, Dr. Beth, Dr. Beth Falls, Falls, and research, and research associate Brandy, Brandy Nelson assess, assess the health of the sediment around the, around the mouth of Tiller Creek, Creek in the Indian, Indian River, River Lagoon. Lagoon. So of all the ways that I have been involved in uh, trying to improve science education, this is the one that I'm most excited about, working with teachers in training in order to make sure that they have the solid foundation that they need in science and math that they can then pass on to their students, as well as the excitement. And I would encourage other scientists to become involved in similar programs, because if you really want to make a difference, then uh, you have to um, teach a teacher, because our future lies in their hands. Thank you.